It is a true pleasure to be here, uh, as you probably, as is the case with probably all the other speakers. It's the first time I've spoken to an actual audience, uh, at least at conferences, for a long time now. So it's uh, it's good to be back, in a sense. Um, so today we're going to talk about getting started with three technologies at the same time: ScalaJS, Laminar, and Vit. So I'm Sébastien Duran from the Scala Center. Let's start with uh, VIT. Uh, what is VIT? It's, it's actually pronounced the, the, the French way. Uh, it is the French for, for quick. Um, VIT is a, one of the zillions JavaScript build tools, or bundlers, or live reloading stuff. However you want to call them, JavaScript has many of those. Um, we choose VIT because the way it uses modules and live reloading um, plays well with how Scala.js can be configured to emit modules as well. So you get something that's quite pleasant to work with. So let's set up VIT first, um, because they have a getting started template, and we don't. So uh, we might as well start with theirs. Right? Um, so we use npm create vit. We take the latest version, um, and uh, it installs a fresh template in a directory. We specifically choose the vanilla framework environment because we're going to use a Scala.js as a language and um, Laminar as our framework. So once we've done that, we cd into that directory, we run npm install, and we run npm run dev, and that starts the vit development server. So from there, you open your local host um, URL, and you get this beautiful web page, hello vit, that comes with the template. So what is vit good for, uh, really? Well, it, the one thing it does really well, and without any configuration, is live changes. So if you go to the main JS file and you change hello vit into something else, for example, hello Scala, the vit development server notices the file change and it sends something to the web. Um, browser to automatically refresh the page and get the changes. Right? So you don't have to refresh the web page manually on the server. The control S is enough to get the new, uh, the new web, web browser. All right, so um, that's about enough JavaScript for today. So uh, let's do some Scala. Right? So, of course, Scala means uh, SBT. Uh, I'm one of those weird people who actually like SBT. So I keep using SBT and not MIL or Scala CLI or whatever. But you could do this with any of the other Scala build tools if you want. So we set up a couple things. Of course, uh, SBT itself, the Scala.js SBT plugin, and then um, some boilerplate config. But there are a few things that are worth pointing out. At the very bottom, we have a dependency on the Scala.js DOM library, which is a library for static types for the entire DOM API, right? so the, the browser APIs. Uh, those are maintained by community members who uh, are keen to have these types up to date, uh, and I'm very grateful for the people who do that. Um, and then there is another piece of really interesting um, configuration about the modules, right? I mentioned earlier, VIT is good with modules in a way that we can configure Scala.js to play well with them. And this is the amount of configuration need from the Scala.js side to play well with VIT. So we configure it to use ES module. ES stands for ECMAScript, which is the true name of JavaScript. Um, and we tell it I want you to split the modules, split the code base in modules automatically according to one rule. Everything that's in the live chart package, which will be our 
application package, I want you to create as many small modules as you can for the classes in that package. And then for every other class, in particular things coming from the standard library or for the libraries that you use, I want you to create as few modules as possible. What is that good for? Well, because if you create really as many modules as possible for the entire application, that creates thousands of very small modules. Uh, basically one per class in, in, your, in your class path that you actually use, right? Except if there are circular dependencies and stuff like that. But basically it's, it's many, many, many modules. And you don't want that because that's bad for Vit to pick up the changes and for the browser to pick up changes. Too many files to read. Um, but um, these things coming from libraries, they don't change very often. Um, if, on the other side, you ask CollegeJS to emit one big module with everything, then every time you change one thing in your app, then that creates an entirely new module that contains that change, but everything else hasn't changed in the entire code base. But Vit has to reprocess all of that, the browser as well, so that's not good. Right? So what you really want is to have as many small modules for your application and as few large modules for your dependencies. So with that line of configuration, Scala.js will do that for you. So then we can write a Scala.js main program. Uh, we use the package live chart that's got to be the same as the one we just configured, otherwise this is not going to work. Um, we import the JS namespace and we import the DOM library and then we have an at main uh, def using the DOM types from Scala.js DOM. So all of that that you see is statically typed. If you make a typo there, the Scala compiler will have your back and tell you that doesn't work. So um, if you do that, well, there is one last thing we need to, um, well, first we need to ask SBT to actually build the Scala.js into one Java, well, a, a set of JavaScript modules. And for that, we use fastlink.js, and we use the tilde option of SBT, that's the watch mode of SBT, so every time you save something in your Scala files, SBT is going to rerun that command. Whoops. And then on the Vit side, there's actually no configuration uh, in Vit. All we do is change the main JS file to import the target product of Scala.js, right? and then Vit will automatically pick up the output of Scala.js. So I said earlier, Vit was good uh, for, for one thing, especially it was live changes. Right? Can we have live changes in, in Scala.js then? Well, yes, we can. And for that, I will do it uh, actually for real. This is my laptop, it's a bit slow, um, but hopefully I will still manage to convey a sense of uh, convenience and um, quickness. So uh, here it is, I have my Vit development server in the background, I have SBT with tilde fastlink.js on the left. Um, you just have to know that it's there, and this is probably way too small for you to read, so let's make it bigger. Um, and we're going to change this. Let's put a 2 here, and I will say top when I press Control S. Top. Okay. Could be faster, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's not, not too bad, right? Yes. So that's about as much live coding as I'm going to do, because I, I don't do that anymore. Too scared. Um, so let's, let, let, let's continue. Okay, so now we've got Scala.js piped into Vit, piped into the browser. And, uh, well, we used the DOM API directly to make our very small application, uh, but we don't really want to use the DOM going forward, so we're going to use a Scala.js UI library called Laminar. So we add Laminar as a library dependency in our build. We reload 
SBT and we reload the dev server of it. And then in our main application, we change our main method to use Laminar. So there is one import you need to get from the documentation of Laminar at the top, and then you get everything. Um, in the main method, we call once that uh, render on DOM content loaded that Laminar gives you, which takes an element of the DOM in which it will work and a Laminar element and we'll render it in the DOM, and from there on, Laminar takes over. And the, the element that we use is defined uh, at the bottom, so the, the type element is, is a Laminar element, and we build HTML uh, things, well, DOM, DOM elements, with function calls. So the div function call creates a div element. The, we use href colon equal as the syntax for, for attributes. So we're not actually directly creating DOM elements here. We're creating laminar elements, and every laminar element is associated with a DOM element in the background. This is not the same as uh, virtual DOMs, right? Virtual DOMs are all the rage, uh, but Laminar doesn't do that. So it's not an immutable view of the world that gets rendered via divs every time, right? The, do the, the Laminar elements really are backed, uh, each one of them by an actual DOM element, and Laminar makes the changes directly. So that's all well and good, but we had a static web page with three elements, that's not very fun, so we're going now to actually build something, right? And for the rest of the talk, we are going to build a live editable bar chart. So for that, we need a data model. So we introduce a data item, this class, for the, the rows of data that we're going to represent in our bar chart. Every data item has a label, which is a text, and a value, which is a double. And then we also give it an ID, which will allow us to retain some sense of identity through changes uh, of the model. If we, if we change one element, well, it's an immutable case class, so we get an, another instance of the case class, but we want to, some, to retain some notion of identity so that we can distinguish two data items, even if their label and values are the same. Then we represent our table, uh, the entire table, as a list of data items. So an immutable Scala list of data items. But it must be editable. So over time, that thing has to change, right? So then you start having questions about how do we model change over time in a UI, and there are many different answers to that question, the laminar answer is to use vars, signals, and events. So we put our list of data items in a laminar var. Well, technically, it comes from the, the library Airstream that laminar uses, but they're developed by the same person. And then we take... So a var is not really... a Scala var, right? It's, uh, it, it's, it's a time-varying immutable value. And then we can get a signal view out of a var, and the signal is a read-only time-varying view on an immutable value. So on a var, you can schedule updates, that's what we do in add data item. But on the signal, all you see is an immutable view of that. So you don't get access to changing stuff. So when I say we schedule updates, I, I systematically use that word schedule because when we call data var.update, this is not a synchronous change. If just after that line, you read what's in data var, it's still what was there before. So updates are scheduled for the next tick of the JavaScript event loop. So let's try to visualize a little bit more those things, those variables, those signals. 
Let's take a completely synthetic example here with a, a, an int var, so a var containing an integer, and it starts with one. And then I create a signal view out of that with int var that signal. And then I map over a signal. So I do int signal.map underscore time two. What do I get? I get another signal of integers where every element of the signal is multiplied by two. But, so this is similar to a collection, right? I mean, you all know collections, you all know the map method on the list. It has a list of elements and you multiply every element and you get a new list. Except here, the signal, it's not, it's not that it has one list of elements at one given time. At any given time, it has one element, right? But as time progresses, that value changes. So we are really constructing an infinite time-varying collection, and we map over that. So this is functional reactive programming at its fullest. If you've ever heard of it before, it's really that model that, that we have here. So if we start with one, the in signal view of the int var immediately represents the value one, and then times two signal at the start contains two. Then when we schedule an update to int var, to increment it by two, it becomes three, and that is immediately reflected into int signal, and then again in times two signal with the double value, and then same if we schedule more updates to the var. So from the left to the right, it's not elements of a collection, it's really time. Right? And then from the top to the bottom is data that propagates through your collections to the signals. So now, how do we use that in our application? Well, we have our data signal, which is a signal of list of data item. So we call map on that to transform every data item into a DOM element, a row of a table. Then the, the data itself, you see there, that's the list of data item then. So then we do a second map on that, and that is really the regular map on the list. Right? And for every item, we call this function render data item, which takes a data item and returns a laminar element that represents it. So that gives us a signal of list of elements. And we would like to be able to put that in a table, in a DOM table. So for that, we have one of Laminar's construct children, and then the left arrow followed by a signal of list of elements. That is a binder in Laminar's terminology, and it tells Laminar every time that signal changes, I want you to update the children of that T body element to represent what's in the signal. Okay? Um, then we also add two buttons, uh, one to add a random element and one to delete a specific element. So you can see that we use, at the very bottom right, we use the ID of the data item to remember which data item we really want to remove. So, um, in the same way that I don't, I don't trust myself to do live coding, I also don't do demos, I do videos now. Um, so, here is the state of our application at this point. So, we have our initial content of our data with one and the value one. I can click plus, and that schedules updates to the data var, which are immediately reflected through the map on the signal to create elements. And then Laminar automatically updates the DOM. I have nothing more to do there. Right? It's auto automatic. I can add elements, I can delete things. But there is a catch, so if you see, I, I select text in there, and then I delete something unrelated, and then the selection disappears. 
that you may think that's okay, it's, yeah, sure, whatever. It's just not not a big deal, right? But it's a symptom of of a deeper problem. Why does the selection disappear? Well, the thing is, um, every time we change something anywhere in our entire table, we ask Laminar to produce an entirely new list of DOM elements. So we throw away all the DOM elements we, have be we had before, and we recreate an entire new list of elements for the data. And that, that causes the loss of selection, but it can be more annoying than that for performance reasons, or for any reason related to, I had my, if there is an edit box in there, I had my cursor in there, and it all disappears, right? So you don't want, we don't want that for, for many reasons. So of course, this is a typical uh, use case in a UI framework, right? So um, clearly we want Laminar to take care of that uh, for us. Right? Um, so Laminar has this notion of splitting, which really uh, focuses on, on that problem. So here we have a data signal, that is what we, we had before, right? And what happens is, at the beginning, from the list of data items, I render every item, and I get one rendered DOM element, R1. And then I update an element, and now I get two new rendered items, R2 and R3. If I instead use the split method of Laminar, then suddenly Laminar can detect that the first the um, data item was already there before, and we find out that it was exactly the same because of its ID. So we use the ID of the data item as a key for Laminar to figure out this is the same thing. So I will reuse the data, the rendered data item that I had previously. Now, um, we have to adapt a little bit our code, so we use split, and then that means that render data item doesn't take one data item anymore, it takes a signal of data item, right? So we now render one element that will depend on a time-varying view of one element. That means that we cannot take directly the label and the value out of the, of the data item, we have to map on that signal to get a signal of string and a signal of double. And somehow we have to put that in the text of the DOM elements. Again, Laminar has us covered. It gives you, again, that left arrow there. So I can bind the signal of string to the text of the TD element, and likewise for the value. So far, so good. So now, if we update this way, nothing changes much, except that we can now add an element, we can select something there, and if we add element, the selection is preserved. Likewise, if we select something and we delete an element, the selection is preserved. Okay, so um, we have a table now, but it would be good to have an actual chart, right? Because <laughs> I promised you a bar chart, so we better do that. And uh, since we don't do, want to do that ourselves, there are libraries out there that do charts for um, the web. And one very famous library is chart.js. So we want to reuse that JavaScript library from Scala.js. So, um, but as usual, we don't want to use dynamically uh, typed things. So we want static types for um, chart.js. And we might write them by hand ourselves. But what's better is to actually use the existing typings that people have, writ have written for TypeScript. And that we can do through a, uh, another project maintained by a community member, which is scalably typed, which fetches TypeScript type definitions and translates them to Scala.js type definitions, so-called facade types, for our benefits, 
to use them. So we configure two things now. We configure um, scalably typed itself in green. So for that, we have an SBT plugin. We need to depend on the TypeScript compiler, and we need to actually enable the scalably typed plugin on our code base. There might be something uh, weird with the timing, because this is a long talk, or it's supposed to be a long talk. It's supposed to end at 25. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> all right, so um, in uh, yellow, we actually depend on the chart.js library in our runtime dependencies, and for the dev dependencies, we depend on the static types that have been written for TypeScript. And that's it. From there, scalably typed takes uh, things, pieces things together, and gives the static types for chart.js. So we can use them. We import typings.chartjs.mod.star, with that the scalably typed way of, of writing things, and we get static types for chart.js. Now we create a, so chart.js wants a canvas DOM element that, it, that you, you present it with, and then it will draw itself inside that canvas. Right? So we create the canvas element in Laminar, because we want everything to fit within our Laminar application. But we don't actually want the content of that element to be handled by Laminar. We want it to be handled by uh, chart.js instead. So now we need to piece two things that want to handle themselves, their things together. And that's uh, where, call, where um, APIs like mount and unmount callbacks come into play. So we use the unmount unmount callback function of Laminar to tell Laminar, when you put that element in the DOM, I want you to call that function, which will delegate stuff to someone else. And uh, if you ever remove it from the DOM, I want you to call that unmount element so I can instruct chart.js to destruct its data structures. Now, in the, in the callback, we can get access to the actual DOM um, element that Laminar creates behind the scenes. And that is, of course, uh, necessary because we need it to give it to um, the constructor for Charge.js here. And then we configure Charge.js with lots of options, but one in particular is that we want a bar chart. Now there is one missing piece is I've created a bar chart and I have a data model, which is a signal which evolves over time. I would like the chart to dynamically reflect every uh, new value in that time varying signal. right? So now we use Laminar's other operator. It has two. Uh, we, see, we, have, we saw the left arrow before, and now we see the right arrow. And the right arrow says, well, when you have something changing on the left, push it to the right. So if, I have, if something changes in the data signal, I want you to push that to that callback. And in the callback, we mutate. It's direct mutations. Uh, we mutate the um, chart.js data model so that it reflects what we have in our immutable but time varying model. In fact, you can see the left arrow as really, I mean, they're basically equivalent, right? The, the, the left arrow takes things from the right and pushes them on the left and, and conversely, right? So this is. This is really just one operator, but depending on your state of mind, uh, sometimes it's more intuitive to think about, let me bind things this way, and sometimes it's more like push changes to the mutable world. So it's... Um... So let's see that in action. So uh, now I actually have a bar chart with one bar. Uh, but I can click the plus button and I get a second element. I can add more elements, I can delete elements, and every time the bar is dynamically updated without me having to do anything more because the plus and delete buttons, they are going to push updates to my immutable but time-varying model, 
and then my right arrow from just before will notice the changes in that time varying model and push mutable updates to charge chart JS. So now we have um, a bar chart where we can add random things, uh, but it would be nicer if we could actually edit the labels and values in there. So we're going to do a little bit of more UI interactions with the, with the user. Let's start by editing the labels, because labels is text, and text is easy, doubles are complicated. Um, so remember we had that signal of data item, and we map it to get a signal of string for the time varying label of that item. And we used the left arrow to bind that time varying string to the text of a TD element. Well, what we want now is an edit box there. So let's put an edit box there. So I use an input element. I set its type to text. And as previously, I want changes from the model to be reflected in the value of that box. So I still use a left arrow there. But I also want that if the user changes something in that edit box, that it should reflect into the model. So there, I take new events from the input, and I want to push changes to my model. So I use a right arrow there. So on every new value that I get from my input, I have a new label, and I update my, I schedule an update for the entire model, in which I go and piece together the item I want to, to swap for, a, for an updated item, and the rest I, left, I leave untouched. So this is, this is all Scala in there. It's, it's a bit tedious, but it's regular, immutable Scala stuff. Now, that pattern of having a right arrow, a callback that takes a value, and that schedules an update to a var, that comes up all the time. So Laminar has a thing for that, and that's called an updater. So this is refactoring. I take my data var, I, dim, I ask for an updater taking strings, and now I have a function from the previous data and the new label to the new data. I have just compressed two things into one function that Laminar gives me because it's a repetitive pattern, that's all. But there is more re repetition here. Um, this is pretty tedious, like taking the data, looking up, uh, mapping everything because I want to swap one element based on its ID for a new element. This is only Scala there, but it's, rep it's a pattern that will come up again. So I want to factor that out as well. So now I factor out this whole thing and I create this make data item updater that takes an ID, so that's a data item ID, and takes a function from one item and a new label to the new item, and then in my function at the bottom, I do the border plate. Notice that I made this function generic in the type of data because we're going to reuse it for the doubles later. One last piece of uh, repetition is I have an input type text, and it has a value that comes from a signal of string, and every time I change the value, I want to push it to an observer of string. That's a very common thing to do, right? So I can create a function to also factor that out. Let me do that. I define a function input for string that takes a signal of string and an observer of string, and it returns an input element that binds the, the signal and the observer to the value of the input. And then from my main program, I call that function, I give it the signal and the observer, and uh, I've refactored a bit of things. So what did we just build there? It's called a component. Right? Many UI frameworks, they have a notion of component, and they, have, they represent that with classes or things like that. And uh, well, we did that with a function. 
Right? This, is, this is the power of uh, functional reactive programming as applied to UI frameworks, is that components are really just regular functions. One piece that I will not really elaborate on, uh, but we have this thing that the value comes from a signal, but the value also pushes to an observer, and we really want them to stay in sync and not have visual glitches and stuff like that. Uh, Laminar gives us this controlled thing that binds them together. Um, I just want you to be aware that this exists, but uh, read the documentation to actually know more about why this is necessary and, and how to use it, uh, because that would otherwise uh, get me out of time for this talk. So, um, I think the video is not even loading. Great. Oh, it is. Let's see. Does it want to load? Ah, it doesn't want to load. Okay, well, ah, it did. Yes, all right. So let's see that in action. Um, now I can, as before, add elements, but I have an input box and I can change, and you can see it's very small, uh, but the labels at the bottom of the chart uh, immediately uh, are updates. Right? We, we didn't have to change anything uh, more because now we're pushing changes to the model and we have already set up chart.js that, so that it mimics the model at all times uh, when we set up chart.js in the first place. And so we have our bar chart dynamically updating. So the very last thing I want to uh, talk about is editing doubles. Doubles are complicated. Why are they complicated? Because you need to parse them and uh, convert them to strings. And uh, that is annoying. So we're going to create another component, this time a component to edit doubles. It has the same structure as before, but now we have to introduce parsing and formatting in the middle. And for that, the easiest way to uh, do that is to introduce an intermediate var of string to um, manipulate, so that if the signal of double changes, we change the var of string. If that changes, we update the input and in the other direction as well. So see here that I'm using uh, a, a new mut mutable uh, aspect within the def that doesn't leak out of the API of input for double. That is the power of encapsulation for you. This is not something you can do with pure functional programming. Right? Pure functional programming will not let you hide that kind of, uh, of stuff out of your API. There will be something, a, a monad or something, hanging in the, in the signature that will remind you that this thing is doing something inside. We don't have to do that here. We can, we can encapsulate the state. And that's my uh, last video. So now we have um, our bar chart again. We can edit the labels, but we can also update the values, and that immediately reflects in the bar chart as adjusting the height of the bar without us having to do anything else again. This concludes this uh, talk. As a, as a summary, so we set up Scala.js and Vit with uh, live reloading, so that when you save your Scala file, um, that produces a new JS file that is picked up by Vit, which sends it to, to the browser, which refreshes, and you get the live reload in your browser. We used Laminar for UI development, and we introduced this functional reactive programming um, paradigm that it uses. We saw how to define so-called components in Laminar, which are functions um, that manipulate signals and updaters. And we even saw how to integrate Laminar with uh, other components provided by another JavaScript library for which we got types for using scalably typed. And uh, I'm going to be taking questions now, uh, if you have some. Thank you. I believe there's a microphone that will... 
Yes, it is coming. And there is a question there. Uh, thank you for the talk. I was wondering um, uh, how does uh, the, the final JS builds with the, the NPM dependency? Because in the web page, we, um, uh, we just added it uh, with the NPM uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think in real life, uh, we will build some bundles and so on that will then be included in the web page. Yes. So is it scalably type that adds uh, all the JS in the bundle, or how is it done? So the reason this works is um, we wrote, so scalably type gave us facade types uh, for, for Scala.js, but they're not just facades. They also contain some annotations that say where that come from. So when you refer, when you actually refer to the chart.js library, Scala.js sees that relationship. It says, oh, you're importing that from that JavaScript library. Let me add an import statement in the produced JavaScript file. Then Vit sees that import statement, and it knows, oh, I can piece that up with a chart.js library, and I'm going to serve that to the browser as well. That's for development. So the, 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 for development, the browser takes Char.js and Scala.js from two different sources. And for production, Vit will actually create a bundle with one JavaScript file that contains everything. Um, yeah. Any other question? There in the middle. Uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, for, the, for the presentation. So I was uh, thinking, what, what is the impact of not using a virtual DOM uh, comparing to React? So is there like uh, less memory usage in, uh, in terms of benefits and in terms of drawbacks, maybe less performance? So um, the proponents of virtual DOMs like to advertise very strongly how performant it is. Uh, it is very performant compared to rebuilding an entire DOM from the virtual DOM every time. Uh, because they do diffing so that they can figure out, actually, I only need to change that part of the DOM. But that's still a lot more work than Laminar, who sees, oh, that signal changed, and I know that signal is bound to that thing here. I'm just going to change that thing here. So Laminar is actually much more performant uh, at least in, in principle, than a virtual DOM, because it doesn't even have to do the diffing. It already knows where it is. So that's, that's a, a very strong advantage of this model. And I believe it is also used from in, in more modern JavaScript libraries like Solid, if I am not mistaken. Uh, Solid.js is a JavaScript library that uses a similar paradigm to also avoid virtual DOM, because it's not that efficient, actually. I believe I've answered one of two parts of your question, but I thought, or there was another part of the question that I missed. No, it's okay, good. Any other question? There's one there. Yeah, so excuse my ignorance related to uh, modules and stuff, but is the um, pattern that you showed at the beginning of the talk uh, the one that you would advise people to use in production? like? Does this mean that um, essentially if you redeploy your web application, the browser will only invalidate the cache for your application JavaScript or? The, um, the way we set things up, uh, Vit by default for production mode will actually bundle all these modules into a single JavaScript file so that it uh, ships one single JavaScript file to, to the client. Um, that, of course, is better for the initial loads. It might not be as good for refreshes and things like that, but if you want that, you could also configure it this way, uh, if you prefer. But uh, I'm, I'm not very an, a, a real expert in that area, so I, I leave that to the people who know how to ship things. <laughs> okay, thank, uh, you. thank you. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, I believe uh, we can go and have lunch. Thank you again. Thank you.